That's right, John. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a fantastic introduction as always and a, a tough act to follow, but I'll give it my best shot here. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, each of us are now gonna break up and review each of the separate topic areas. And uh, at the beginning of each topic area, I just wanted to say that we're gonna be going through the agenda of what we're gonna be hitting. Uh, this is a slide here of the fundamental planning knowledge is the first section. There is a lot in this section. Uh, there's a lot of variety and we're gonna be going through it as quickly as possible to get through it. Uh, but as John said, if there's any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, if we, we have a chance to respond to them, we definitely will. Uh, I'm gonna be covering uh, history of planning and the planning movements to begin with. And uh, one thing that we'll also do at the beginning of each chapter is we're gonna provide a list of what we think are the great resources um, for each topic. And this here are the three that we are recommending that you really take a look at to help you with this. Uh, the first is the planning theory for practitioners by Brooks. The second is local planning, contemporary principles and practices by numerous authors. And our favorite is the timeline of American planning history. So uh, this has really morphed into two different formats over the years since we've been uh, providing this training. I've provided a link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, sometimes that link moves around, different chapters pick it up. Uh, but if you Google the timeline of American planning history, you'll quickly find an 11 page Word document that just does an amazing document that the APA put out that begins in 1785 and through a timeline hits all of the main uh, planning movements, influences on the planning profession, and planning authors and books since that time. It's a tremendous resource. The second thing that I want to give a shout out to is the APA. Uh, just in the last refresh, the APA put this timeline in a very interactive format on their website, and it's an amazing resource. That one begins in 1900. Uh, they did an amazing job with it. So please take a look at those two resources, and that's really going to help you with this section. Uh, this slide illustrates some of the general timeline of the planning history you should be familiar with. Moving from left to right, the chart highlights five key movement, moments in time for a profession, including ancient foundations, colonial America, the beginning of US planning, the beginning of the modern planning movement, and finally modern planning. For each of those, we list only a small set of examples. For each of these examples, ask yourself, why was it important for planning? What was unique about it? Why is it worth knowing? Who was involved? And why is it something that I should know for the exam? I'm just going to talk about a few of these. For example, under US planning, a few bullets focused on Riverside, Illinois. Uh, when we hear from other planners that have taken the exam and our own experience, there always seems to be a few questions about Riverside, Illinois. So for example, some things that you might want to know is that it was the first suburban community in the United States. It was designed in 1869 by Calvert Vaux and Frederick Law Olmsted. Olmsted and Vaux designed, Vaux designed a lot of urban parks throughout the country, and Riverside was designed, uh, designated a National Historic Landmark in 1970. One term that if you see on the exam, and I'm gonna try my best to say it without messing it up, is curvilinear streets. If you see that term in the exam, the chances are that that has to deal with the village of Riverside. Under modern planning, I wanted to point out real quick the multiple nuclei model. This was invented in 1945 by Harris and Ullman. They developed that model uh, that stated that the central business district was no longer the only center of an urban area. In earlier models, the CBD was the core of the urban land use and was found at the very heart of every older city. I think an example of this in your daily practice is when you look at a regional plan uh, here in Chicago, um, it is definitely a multiple nuclei model that developed where there are a lot of larger communities, a lot of cities outside of the city of Chicago that have become a center with business, entertainment, and high density. And so that would be an example of a multiple nuclei model. Uh, the last one I just wanted to mention before I go to the next slide is new urbanism. That began in the 1980s. Uh, it's a planning and development approach based upon the principles of how cities and towns have been built for centuries. If you think of walkable blocks and streets, housing and shopping in close proximity, the accessible to public spaces. And in other words, new urbanism focuses on the human scale. 
the history of the American Planning Association. So to be quite honest, the APA loves to ask questions about themselves on the exam. And I don't blame them if it was a question about, if it was a, uh, sorry, uh, an exam about myself, I'd have a lot of questions about myself too. So here are some of the main points to be familiar with because they often can show up on the exam. In 1909, the first national conference on city planning was held in Washington, DC. In 1917, American City Planning Institute um, was created in 1939. Uh, sorry, it was renamed the American Institute of Planners in 1939 and it was created. In 1934, the American Society of Planning Officials, ASPO, was created. In 1978, the AIP and ASPO merged to form the APA. That right there is a very typical question that you may see on the exam. And then lastly, in 1999, AICP inaugurated a College of Fellows, of which, of course, Devin and, and John are on now, the FAICP to recognize distinguished individual contributions. Examples of planning first. You're gonna find a lot of these on those timelines that the APA has put out. So one I just wanted to mention here on this slide is, for example, that the first comprehensive plan was completed in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1925. It was led by Alfred Bettman and George Ford and Ernest Goodrich, who by the way, owned the first planning consulting firm in the country. The next slide highlights the planning, uh, the planning, for, planning moment, movements, really for me to say. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these movements, but go back into your uh, planning 101 days and be familiar with the different type of movements that have existed and why. Uh, one thing that really happened uh, that really resulted a lot, the creation of a lot of these movements is the paradigm shift in the 20th century at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the industrialized cities to the 19th century, of course, grew at tremendous rates and as a result, there was a lot of pollution and it really impacted the working class and the poor. A lot of these movements on this slide are a direct result from that. Two examples that I wanted to just quickly note are edge cities. Be familiar with that term. Edge city is a concentration of businesses, shopping and entertainment outside of a traditional downtown in what had previously been a residential or rural area. It was popularized in the 1991 book, Edge City, Life on the New Frontier by Joel Guru. The other one that I want to talk about is the City Beautiful movement. Uh, this is a one topic area that you need to be familiar with. There's going to be a lot of questions on the exam based upon the City Beautiful movement, who the players were, uh, the developments that happened because of that. And of course, Burnham and the Chicago's World Fair with its white city are very important features to know of this movement. Famous books and authors. We've listed here only just a few. Be familiar with why each book is valuable to our profession. One person I wanted to note on this slide is Jane Jacobs. Be familiar with her work. She, of course, wrote The Death and Life of Great American Cities in 1961. And she was a critic of what she called the rationalist planners of the 50s and 60s, especially Robert Moses. She often argued that modernist urban planning overlooked and oversimplified the complexity of human lives in diverse communities. And she was a very big uh, influence on stopping a lot of urban renewal programs that were going to basically destroy a lot of neighborhoods. And because of her work throughout the country and even up in Toronto, Ontario, she was able to help save a lot of communities. This is a slide here that Devin, John and I like to call the big six. These are extremely important planning pioneers. Um, be familiar with each of these planning pioneers. Why were they important to our profession? You're not going to be shown a picture of them on the exam and asked to pick up from the lineup who each is, uh, but you definitely have to know why they're important to our profession. Planning landmarks. Once again, another great thing that the APA has put on their website is a list of what they consider planning landmarks. There are dozens and dozens and dozens. Uh, if you ever have time or uh, have some interest, I would strongly take a look at this section. You are not going to have to know about every single one of them, but if uh, you see one that piques your interest, it's worth diving into. Uh, these planning landmarks are all presented for projects at least 25 years or older and are historically significant and help create a new direction in the field of planning. So once again, if the APA is gonna ask us questions, I think they are gonna ask us questions about projects that they think are historical or planning landmarks. 
Uh, the APA also wants us to remember that we need to be familiar with uh, those planners who may not be either professionally trained planners or have been educated as planners. Um, there are examples of people, as I've shown on this slide here, these four that are uh, fantastic resources and really help shape the field of planning today. We've got Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses. I love the way that we have the two of them together on this side, and then Saul Alinsky. Um, Alinsky, just if you're not familiar with him, please do some research on him. Uh, of course, Alinsky was a community activist and political theorist. His work through the Chicago-based Industrial Areas Foundation helped poor communities organize to press demands upon landlords, politicians, and business leaders. This slide here uh, shows us the influences on our profession. Um, this is something that the APA in their last refresh has really started to put some focus on. They essentially want us to know as planners that we don't make decisions in a bubble. We're impacted by a lot of different influences. We've listed here four of the biggest ones just to know. Think about in your own planning decisions and the planning work you do. What are the social influences? Think about the political influences. How is your elected and appointed officials help shape your planning decision? How do they help implement plans and get things done? Think about economic influences. I think before the pandemic, economic influences were huge. I have a feeling because we're in it and as we get out of it, they're even going to become more important, but be familiar with those. And then lastly, be aware about the environment, the natural environment, how your planning decisions either take into account what the current existing, current conditions are or how your plan may impact that either one way or the other moving forward <clears throat> into the future. Uh, this slide here uh, is the beginning of the legal principles and decisions. Um, this is our way to help us talk about the law questions. Um, an area of an exam that we get a lot of questions about is what can we expect from the law questions? How much should we know? So three things that Devin and John and I have learned over the years is these three things to keep in mind. The first, know the name, date, and what level of court the particular uh, case went to. Second, know as a, much about the case as it fits on the screen of your phone when you Google it on Wikipedia. Um, I may or may not be joking just a little bit, but in all honesty, when we were studying for this years ago, we used to get giant documents about each case and you'd really have to try and pick through what information you'd know. And to be honest, it was very overwhelming. Now, if you just, for example, look at your phone right now, Google a law case as we go through this, turn your phone sideways so it's landscape and see how much information is in that Wikipedia article. That is all you need to know. And really what it is saying is why is that case important to planning and you as a planner? Some key uh, text or sorry, some key amendments to the United States Constitution that impact planning. First Amendment. The First Amendment prohibits the government from making laws prohibiting the free exercise of religion, the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of people to peaceably assemble. When you think about the First Amendment, ask yourself, how does this impact me as a planner? Some things that honestly jump to mind really quick are signed ordinances and religious land uses and RARLUPA. Those are things that would be impacted or affected by the First Amendment. Regarding sign ordinances, I'm sure you're like me, ever since the 2015 decision by uh, Reed versus the town of Gilbert, my sign ordinance needs to be updated. We're currently updating that right now, but a lot of communities, almost every community in the country actually, had to be updated from that decision. Reed versus the town of Gilbert, if you remember, was a United States Supreme Court case that clarified when municipalities may impose content-based restri restrictions on signage. Be familiar with the Fifth Amendment. That Fifth Amendment states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Uh, one thing there that I wanted to touch on at the end of that for planners is it's basically saying that the government cannot seize private property without making a due compensation at the market value of that property. One case to be familiar with this is in 2005, Kelo versus the city of New London. That US Supreme Court case rendered a controversial opinion in which they held that a city could constitutionally seize private property 
for private commercial development, where the redevelopment would economically benefit an area that was sufficiently distressed. That was a huge case, if you remember back in 2005, that basically turned a lot of uh, policies on their head, if you will. Actually, following up from that case, a lot of states actually enacted their own passage, uh, their own statutory amendments to counteract Kilo and expanded their protection for the for the condemnation. And then, lastly, the Fourteenth Amendment. This is the Due Process Clause, which prohibits state and local government officials from depriving persons of life, liberty, or property without legislative authorization. Be familiar with the many key housing acts that have taken place and what the unique character, characteristics of are each one. For example, in 1934, that housing act was part of the New Deal. It pa was passed during the Great Depression in order, order to make housing and home mortgages more affordable. The Housing Act of 1954 provided funding for 140,000 units of public housing. And lastly, the Housing Act of 1968, often referred to as the Fair Housing Act, that act made it illegal to not sell or rent a dwelling to any person because of race, color, disability, religion, sex, familiar status, or national origin. As planners were in a very powerful position when it comes to private property and our impact upon how people can use their land, sometimes that can make for some very uncomfortable or confrontational situations. So this is a case on this slide, Village, versus, Village of Euclid versus Ambler, Realty that if you can quote, it can sometimes get you out of uh, some uh, interesting situations right, right away. You can quote that because it says the court held that the zoning ordinance was not an unreasonable extension of the village's police power and therefore was not unconstitutional. So basically, it was the first case that gave us the power to zone. Uh, the next slide talks about eminent domain. Uh, eminent domain is uh, once again, I talked about the Kilo versus the city of New London, but that talks about the takings issue, which was also addressed in the Fifth Amendment. Let's talk about the theories of planning and uh, about planning. We've listed here eight of the main theories to be familiar with. I'm going to just briefly talk about transactive planning. Transactive planning was a break from the previous models because instead of considering public partition, participation as a method that would be used in addition to the normal planning process, it was turned as the central goal, the central part of the process was making sure that the public were involved and they were included in the process from the very beginning. The APA also wants us to be familiar with the growth and development of places and the country over time. From a historical point of view, they ask a lot of questions typically about the growth towards the West. Most of the settlement patterns were formed along physical patterns, such as roads, railways, and around natural features such as water bodies and topography. One important policy that we've shown on the screen here is the Ordinance of 1785. That established the Rectangular Land Survey, which led to the settlement of the Western United States. You may see some very simple drawings or illustrations on your exam. One you may see is a question similar to the ones on this slide that may show the different types of planning models. This slide illustrates the three to be familiar with. Think about how your own city developed and if it followed one of these models. Think about why a city would grow like this. The first is the concentric zone model, also known as the Burgess model or the CCD model. It is one of the earliest theoretical models to explain urban social structures created by Ernest Burgess in 1925. The next is the sector model, it's a model of urban land use proposed in 1939 by land economist Homer Hoyt, and it's a modification of that concentric zone model. And then the last, I've talked about this already, is the multiple nuclei model. For example, it's uh, very similar to here in Chicago, a lot of different central business districts spread out along the main core. The role of transportation in shaping urban form. One of the things that also came out of the refresh of the APA exam a couple of years ago is the APA really wants us to think of the connectivity between urban planning landforms, the shape of the city and transportation. Think about how back in the day in, in the beginning of the country and even in the European settlements, think about how narrow those streets were and why. Well, obviously they were designed at a time before the automobile. A lot of the transportation was by walking or maybe horse and buggy. That led to the different shape of the city. 
Now, fast forward to today, especially in America, think about how much land is now allocated to our cities. Think about how much wider our streets are, how much land goes to parking lots, interchanges, rails, ports, and airports. Planners do not create communities, uh, great communities alone. Um, the one thing that the APA also wants to stress is that we work with a lot of different professions to make things happen. And the more partnerships and teams we can be on, the better the planning product at the end of the day. So that concludes my section. I'm gonna turn it over to Devin now, but I know it's a lot of material and I've covered a lot as quickly as possible. But hopefully I've done a great job trying to cover and give you a highlight of everything you can highlight. Before I, I sign off for Devin, my best advice is to not get too deep into the weeds. One thing that I saw when I was at PDO is that planners who didn't do well in the exam really got down to the nitty gritty too much, if you will. Just try and be as dangerous as possible be a little higher level in your understanding. You don't need to get down into the weeds, so to speak. Try to keep a higher level, and I think you're going to be great on the exam. 